everyone. Happy Heart Failure Awareness Week. Please join Dr. Heather Ross, registered dietitian, Margaret Brum, and nurse practitioner, Stella Kozusko for this free patient moderated session during this Heart Failure Awareness Week. The webinar will cover innovations in heart failure research, in particular, the latest findings on sodium and diet, and we'll also highlight the importance of patient participation in research and ways to get involved. Participant questions are, and input are welcome. Please do so in the chat. Plus, you will get a sneak preview of our new Ted Rogers Center Heart Research Patient Education site. My name is Santa Cuda. I will be your moderator this evening. I am a UHN patient partner and caregiver for my parents who are both patients at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. My mom in particular has been a cardiac and then a heart failure patient for the past 25 years. And sodium, I could say, has been a discussion, actually a dilemma for us over the years, especially at the beginning of the journey, as we as a family went to zero tolerance on table and processed salt. I'm proud to say that it lasted for two years but it created a lot of stress and was too difficult to manage. So I'm looking forward to tonight. I'm sure we all know and recognize tonight's clinical uh, experts. Dr. Heather Ross, head of division of cardiology at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center and site lead at Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research. Margaret Brum, rest registered dietitian at the University Health Network and Stella Kozusko, nurse practitioner at the University Health Network. Following the presentations, the, pan, the panel will be taking your questions in the chat. We encourage a robust discussion following the presentation. We want to create a respectful environment for all to learn and understand the important life-saving information to be shared this evening. Let's begin with our first presenter, Dr. Heather Ross, we will discuss the recent sodium study and its implications for patients and caregivers as they manage their health, followed by Margaret Brum, who will break it down to what this means for your diet, your salt intake, and other ways to eat healthy to better manage your symptoms and stay well. Dr. Ross? Santa, thank you very much. So uh, it is my pleasure to talk about the uh, study of dietary uh, intervention under 1500 milligrams or 100 millimoles, which is why it's called the sodium HF100 uh, in heart failure. So heart failure and dietary sodium, as you have heard from Santa, um, this, is, this is a, it's a big question. Uh, heart failure has been associated with this concept of neurohormone activation or the fact that the heart's not pumping adequately the body turns on a whole series of systems to try to compensate for that. Uh, and many of those systems really are more flogging the heart than actually beneficial. So beneficial short term, but not long term. And a lot of the medications we use are designed to actually block that activation. A key component of heart failure is salt and fluid retention, as many have felt in terms of swelling in their ankles and in their belly and issues associated with shortness of breath because of fluid in the lungs. And so from an observations for more than a hundred years, we have focused, we meaning the clinic environment, have focused on the need for dietary sodium and water restriction to try to reduce the risk of volume overload. And this has been around for a long time and there is little evidence to support the practice. And before you go all crazy on me now, we have to remember that there's not also not been a study of parachutes. So sometimes what we believe based on our best gestalt, which is what's in this slide, which I don't want you to even look at, but it is our way as clinicians to try to understand what's known as the pathophysiology or how is it that salt intake or sodium intake could end up leading to heart failure. And it is complex, but the real question is, does it? actually matter. Uh, next slide. So we, it comes to salt and pepper, right? And we just don't have any randomized controlled trials or what we call RCT in the lingo uh, that involve pepper or salt or salt and pepper uh, for patients with heart failure. So we really don't know. 
And in fact, when you look at what our literature says, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, which are one of the most important guidelines around, say, you know, be less than 2.3 grams of sodium. They're really, again, not based on any evidence. And the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology have said the same thing. Avoid excess sodium. They don't state what excess is, but we tend to say in the clinic, as many of you have heard us say, sort of in that uh, two grams of sodium a day. Well, why had we started to, to say some of this? And, and this is based on some of the early work that was done. And one of the first studies that was done was an observational study uh, next, uh, that looked at 121 patients. And when we say observational study, what, what we mean by that is we just look at a group of patients or a cohort of patients, and we look at the, their salt intake. So this study looked at 123 patients, and they looked at their salt intake, and they graded it based on uh, what the patient's uh, history was. And then they followed the patients out to see what happened. And what they saw was that in those patients who had high salt intake, uh, they had more events. So they were more likely to end up being hospitalized. Uh, and uh, this trend towards uh, risk or concern of, of higher mortality. Now, it, it does show as a significant p-value, anything less than 0 0.05 is considered significant by us. But again, the numbers are pretty small. Uh, so it goes goes along with what we've been telling patients for, uh, for 100 years, but it's really just observation. Uh, the next study in the next slide was done uh, out of Mexico, and this was uh, a small randomized trial of 195 patients. Uh, and again, this concept that uh, if you actually restrict salt, you can uh, see an improvement uh, in terms of the outcome, but it, the study was small. Um, and so we're still left being uncertain. So sometimes what we do when we're uncertain is we combine a whole series of studies and that's what's met by a systematic review. And what we try to do is to increase the power of the, of the research or increase what we can infer or imply from the research by grouping all these different studies that are done in multiple places. And, and this was a systematic review that was done None of the studies were more than 100 patients. Some of the interventions or what they tried to do in terms of salt restriction were a little different uh, between the different studies. But what that study showed was, again, no consistent result uh, in terms of the outcome. And that brings us then to, uh, to the next, uh, well, you're one slide ahead of me, uh, brings us to the next study, which was done uh, and published in one of our big journals, which is called the Jack Study. And what they did here is something called a propensity match cohort. If you can just go back a slide for me. So what a propensity match, uh, no, you're in between. There's another slide in there. Maybe it's, maybe it's been lost, but what they did was this propensity match study where they looked at a group of patients and then they went to a large administrative style database where they had many, many patients. And they said, okay, I have a, a, a woman who's uh, gonna have her 60th birthday this year. We can celebrate that later, uh, who has blonde hair and looks like this. And I wanna find a few people in this cohort that look like her and we match so that it's as close as we can get to being the same. And then they follow the outcome. And what they found in that study actually was a signal for risk with salt restriction. So that was a big surprise. And, and uh, you know, that sort of goes counter to, and that's the slide there. And that sort of goes counter to everything that we have thought about, about salt for the last hundred years. When this happens, we are in a place in research that's known as clinical equipoise. So what we mean by equipoise is that the balance here on the weight scales, pardon that pun, between salt restriction and not salt restriction, it's unclear because we have observational early data suggesting salt restriction is good. And then we have this other propensity study that said, suggested maybe it's not good. Uh, and so we're in between these two trying to understand what the right decision is. And it is in that context of equipoise that the sodium study uh, was designed. And so the next slide is the actual clinical question. So the question that we ask is, does advising a patient to lower the amount 
of sodium they take in their diet to 1500 milligrams actually change the outcome for the patient. And again, this is, you know, we think about railway tracks in Antarctica and, and roadmaps in Antarctica. This is, uh, can only be considered uh, an evidence free zone. We just don't know based on what I've told you so far. So we'll skip ahead to the next slide. So the objectives of the study were to evaluate whether this low sodium diet compared to usual care, and we didn't stipulate what usual care was. So I'm gonna circle back to that statement uh, when I show the results. And we wanted to see if that changed the outcomes on at one year in terms of a primary endpoint. So that's, that means that's the, the outcome of interest for the study. And this is a composite endpoint, which means a combined endpoint. So we look at all of these different pieces and group them together. Uh, and the combined endpoint was the risk of death, the risk of cardiovascular hospitalization, and the risk of cardiovascular emergency room visits, because even visiting the emergency room is something we're trying to avoid uh, in our patients. The secondary endpoints, and please feel free to ask me why these weren't the primary ones, because I'm sure from the patient perspective, they probably should have been, are quality of life. Uh, exercise capacity that's measured by the six minute walk test. Quality of life is measured by a standardized uh, questionnaire known as the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, KCCQ. And then we also looked at the New York Heart Association class, which is a subjective way that patients describe uh, how they're feeling. So the next slide shows the study design and it is, uh, it is a randomized study. So if some of you on the call were in the study, the overall numbers in the trial were 841 patients who had heart failure. Um, and just like flipping a coin, uh, basically if you met the criteria for the study uh, through a, a randomization process, you were put into the less than or targeting 1500 milligrams of sodium versus what you already do. Um, and then we did the follow-up uh, at 12 months uh, with the endpoints that I've already uh, discussed in the previous slide. Next. So this was a global study. And, uh, you know, it's a huge shout out to Enzo DeLuca and Margaret Brum because we were the number one recruiting site in the world. Uh, and uh, they really did a, a ton of work to make that happen. But the massive kudos go out to every patient who actually volunteered to be involved in the study because there was equipoise. There was this potential that maybe a lower sodium isn't a good thing. So as patients, when you sign up and agree to do these crucially important questions, it may not benefit you, but it does change the landscape for everybody else as a result of the information that we gain. So massive, massive kudos to patients for getting involved. So pretty simple again, uh, low sodium, 1500 milligrams or usual care. Um, and that, that was the, uh, the way the study was designed. And you guys did it. So, uh, you know, you heard Santa say how difficult it is. And, and you know, uh, I, again, just uh, am amazed, right? It's, uh, I, I challenge our residents and fellows all the time to try to do this. Uh, this is no small feat. And, you know, we've become quite accustomed to how salt adds flavor to our food and then having it removed can make the food feel bland. Um, and then once it's removed and you taste something salty, you're like, oh, wow, oh, wow. Uh, so this is no small thing. But what I really wanna highlight here, I think, outside of the patients who were in the study who got down to 1,658, that's an average for all the over 800 patients in the study. What I really wanna highlight is that the usual care arm is sitting at just over two grams. So that speaks to incredible uh, fortitude just on, for all the patients who've actually hit what we have been counseling patients to do uh, for some time. So again, pretty impressive. Uh, and, and it allows us to believe that we can look to these results as being quite important and real because of the actual difference between the two groups in salt intake. And the drum roll. So the primary endpoint, 
So this was this combined endpoint of cardiovascular related hospitalization, emergency department visit or risk of dying. Um, and there was no difference. So although the red line, uh, which is sodium looks slightly better uh, than the gray line, which was usual care, we use statistics on this. What I wanna point out is that if you look at the vertical axis, the overall rates over one year here of that combination are pretty low. Um, so, right, when we add all of those three things together, the overall risk at one year was only about 15%. That's actually pretty remarkable. Um, in large part, we see more as it relates to emergency room visits and hospitalizations often. So one of the big comments in the study when it was discussed and presented internationally was that we had an overall low event rate in our population, which probably speaks to how well patients were managed in terms of their background medication. So all those meds that you take, which we know have an impact on your outcome. So even though the curves look a little different, the actual difference here is not even a 1% difference, right? So because the overall risk of anything happening ended up being quite low in the study, the actual curves are very similar and this difference was not significant. So restricting salt didn't change that risk. Uh, this is them now each broken out because secondary outcomes was each one of the components that went into the composite primary outcome. So I've broken them down here so that you can see and it didn't change your risk of dying. It did not change your risk of being in hospital and it did not change your risk of ending up in the emergency room. So no difference. And here you may say, well, it looks like low sodium was worse in terms of the risk of dying, but that difference is not significant. Much like on the previous slide, the actual split between the two lines is actually really small, at less than 1% when we get out to one year. Next slide. So, you know, sometimes a trial that doesn't show what we think it's gonna show is, a is almost as, or if not more hugely important than studies that do show what we think we were gonna show. I think most of us felt going into the study that salt restriction mattered. And what we learned is salt restriction from two grams down to 1.5. So let's make sure we're very clear I'm not saying go out and eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying two grams versus 1.5 did not make any difference for patients in terms of the composite endpoint and the risk of, of dying. But what we did see was an improvement in quality of life in those patients. I didn't show the graphs because they're a little difficult to interpret, but we did see an improvement in terms of quality of life as measured by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire and we did see an improvement in functional class, which is the shortness of breath that people feel when they do exertion. When we tried to objectify that with a six minute walk test, uh, in fact, that was not actually different between the two groups. Next. So what are our implications? A low, low sodium diet of 1500 milligrams as done in the sodium heart failure study can be used to, as a treatment to improve quality of life. Uh, Margaret's going to address, I think, some of the issues about thinking about overall heart health strategy, because there is a truckload of evidence for salt avoidance when it relates to people with hypertension and with other issues. And remember, the usual care arm of the study was two grams of salt. So it wasn't four or five grams of salt. And maybe that's something we need to to do in a, in, a, in, a larger, in a larger way to understand or what's known as a pragmatic or real world study, but with many, many, many more patients where we follow people and understand and start to be able to say, these are the different thresholds of salt intake, but going from two down to 1.5 doesn't change major outcomes. And, and this is very important to help go back to those guidelines that I showed you at the beginning that didn't provide uh, any data for the recommendations. Next. So, yep, there's the salt and pepper selfie. Um, we'll move on to the next. 
this was a this was a huge uh, deal uh, in the heart failure world. So the Lancet is um, one of the you know top three medical journals for all of medicine, um, and uh, this was presented at a big international meeting and simultaneously published in the Lancet. Um, so it speaks to again to our overwhelming thanks for all the patients who got involved because this. This study, I think, will have far-reaching ramifications for patients, as evidenced by the next slide, which you know highlights some of the the key Twitter comments that that we heard. Uh, so, no real difference, honestly. My first take: this will come as a welcome relief to those patients who, quite honestly, over adhere to the 1,200 milligram sodium restriction to their detriment. Insert people like me. Also, reduce the shame in thinking I'm not doing enough. Re-emphasis on a balanced diet with moderate activity is much more realistic. I think the take home message here is the OCD on extra low sodium, which involves a complete overhaul of everyone's diet and lifestyle has far worse and potentially deleterious effects on mental health, uh, on mental health. And then a uh, final comment, which we put in larger letter, it's massive, the guilt, your heart is failing you and now you're failing even more because of too much sodium, which is in everything. And I'm obviously really excited to hear what what you know everybody's comments are here on the on the on this webinar over the salt uh, issue. Next slide. So again, I I, I have thanked everybody, and I, I you know you can move on to the next. I just I really can't understate it enough. If we hadn't studied this, if we hadn't studied this, we wouldn't know, and we would continue to recommend to people go down to 1500 milligrams, go down to 1500. There may be some patients where that makes sense, uh, where it, there's a clear relationship between that patient's salt and fluid overload. And that's one of the things that we're gonna drill down into this study. We have uh, the ability to do fascinating work because many patients in the study gave blood samples for what we call biobanking which allows us to start doing some more exploration. Are there genetic profiles that put people at risk for salt? Are there novel biomarkers that tell us who may be at more risk from salt? So when we look at the overall cohort and we look at those patients who had something happen to them during the study, can we identify any signal that helps us understand which those patients are where it may make more sense to restrict salt? as opposed to painting everybody with the same brush and making everybody restrict their salt down to a level, which frankly really can impact uh, ability to, to, uh, to do a diet and, and, and to, to have quality of life. Next slide. So um, hold the salt. Uh, so, you know, this is what we were hoping uh, to answer. And I think we did. So surprising results show that a low salt diet did not prevent death or hospital visits, but may improve quality of life. And, uh, you know, all the other major journals have uh, re-echoed uh, this study from Nature Medicine on through, because it really has been uh, a landmark study at uh, the first of its kind to really answer what should have been answered a lot of years ago, a pretty simple question, which is, should we salt restrict? And now what we can say is in most patients, salt restriction from two down to 1.5 will not change uh, outcomes. I'll hand over to Margaret here. Okay, I could listen to Dr. Ross all day long. <laughs> I wanna start off with that. So what I'd like to do is focus on diet quality. That's what we know. Next slide, please. We skipped one. I think it's overlapped, it looks like here. It's the previous slide. Okay, perfect. So the Global Burden of Disease uh, is a study that looked at the health effects of dietary risks in 195 countries over the years of 1990 to 2017. And the study is probably one of the most comprehensive pictures that gives us a, 
a look at the potential impact of a suboptimal diet, so a diet of poor quality on cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, chronic kidney disease, and type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. What we found was that worldwide uh, in 2017, poor diet, and we'll define that in a moment, was linked to 11 million deaths and principally from cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please. The top five dietary risks were a high sodium diet. So this is defined as 5,600 milligrams of sodium. So very much unlike the sodium heart failure study. A, a diet low in whole grains, a diet low in fruit, a diet low in nuts and seeds, and low in, in vegetables. And if we go to the sixth one, also low in omega-3s. And we know we have great data from the heart failure community that shows that there are a lot of micronutrient deficiencies in this community. Next slide. When we look at the Canadian diet, uh, the main contributors of excess sodium come from bakery goods and mixed dishes, each contributing about 20% of that excess sodium in our diet. Bakery goods could be things that you see in the bakery section of your grocery store. So cookies, donuts, scones, but also breads, bagels, flatbreads, et cetera. Mixed dishes contribute an, another 20% of excess, excess sodium. And that could be uh, a shepherd's pie, a lasagna, a burrito, for example. Processed meats, another 10 to 15%. So think of luncheon meats sausages, hot dogs, and bacon, and then a little less than 10% for the remaining categories, so cheese, soups, and those are store-bought soups, sauces, dips, gravies, and condiments. So what I did here was I tried to take those major components of excess sodium, and I put it together for a typical lunch, which is a sandwich, and how easily it could add up. Bread, each slice of bread on average is about 200 milligrams, a teaspoon of mustard, 120. The lettuce is ne negligible. If you look at cheese, it's about 310 milligrams. Six thin slices of luncheon meat, of turkey luncheon meat, at seven, almost 700. And your second slice of bread at 200. So without even knowing it, you're at 1,500 milligrams. If you have two sandwiches for lunch, you're already at 3,000 milligrams. So it could add up pretty quickly. Next slide. So what we need to do is read your labels. And then the nutrition facts table provides us with uh, a great amount of data. And when I do nutrition teaching with our patients, they come back with, you know, um, now that I have targets, this is where I can make some better choices. So the best way to use this is first look at the amount of food. And I don't know, if, and I can use my slide pointer here. So for this, Serving size, this is for yogurt, it's three quarters of a cup. And you can see that the numbers are listed here in percent daily value. It's important to look at that amount because many people will double that. So it's easier to have a cup and a half if you actually measure it, a cup and a half really isn't a lot. So if I was to have a cup and a half of yogurt, then I certainly had to double all these numbers. When you look at the percent daily value, instead of trying to add up all those milligrams for the day, an easy way to do this is by definition, if it's 5% or less, there's a little bit of a nutrient. And usually we want maybe some less fat or saturated fat or less sodium. And there are some things that you want a lot of. And by definition, that would be 15% or more. And some things that we want more of would be fiber, for example. So if I was doing some teaching with a patient and we're trying to look for a bread that would be suitable, we can say, well, we'll try to find a, a bread per serving size where the saturated fat is less than 5%, the sodium about 10%, and I'd like a high fiber bread. So I'd look for something with 15% or more. And that's some of the, the things that you can incorporate when you're in the grocery store to decide whether that product goes into the shopping cart or back onto the shelf. Next, please. Again, it's overlapping. Okay, so here is a good way to use the nutrition facts table. So when you look at this product, I've used two of the same, uh, a, a, 
uh, soy sauces from the same company. Here is uh, the regular soy sauce. Here's the light. The portion size is the same. It's one tablespoon. And this is what it looks like if you're using it at home. If you're out, um, if you bought it at a restaurant or like takeout, they'd give you these little packets. These are also a tablespoon. So you can see that one packet or one tablespoon for regular soy sauce is about a thousand. And the less sodium is still about 500, or if you look at the percentage, it's still over 15. And the reason I use this example, because again, this is what patients tell me in the clinic, that they, they're no longer using a regular soy sauce, they're using the less sodium soy sauce, but they're not checking the nutrition facts table. So it's really important to do that to really know how much sodium is there. And, then, and if you looked at the, if we go back to that global burden of disease study and trying to avoid that 5,600 milligrams of sodium, we really need to keep an eye on these condiments that we may be adding to our diet. Because typically people use more than one or two tablespoons at a time. The next slide, another, again, patients come back to me and they say, okay, you know, I'm not using soy sauce, but I found a sriracha sauce. So this is now a very popular condiment. But again, let's look at the serving size. We're only talking about one teaspoon of salt, uh, one teaspoon here. And if we're comparing it to the soy sauce, which they used a tablespoon, here you're looking at three teaspoons is equivalent to a tablespoon. So what we need to do is triple this number. Uh, so 240 times three. So really we're at 720. So if you compare it to the soy sauce, whether it's regular soy sauce, a light soy sauce, this is so, so we're in the middle. And so the reason I wanted to go over this is that we're not adding a lot of salt to our food, but we may be adding, consuming a lot of salt in these condiments. And we certainly don't want to get to that 5,600 mark. Next slide, please. So if we're going to wrap it up and we want to improve our diet quality, because we can see that we can reduce um, cardiovascular disease, and, uh, death from cardiovascular disease, well, we're going to read our labels and we're going, uh, in, when we're in the grocery store, but we also need to focus on what to include in our diet. And I think that's really important, probably even more important, be, um, as you can see from, from uh, that original study, the global burden of disease. And so I like to use a plate model. This, um, this way you don't have to weigh food. You don't have to measure food. Use a very visual model. So for example, at lunch and dinner, you, you would assure that half your plate is vegetables, whether it's cooked vegetables, raw vegetables, frozen vegetables are another great choice. You ensure that 25% of your plate or a quarter of your plate is your protein. So your meat, your fish, your chicken, and don't shy away from your legumes. So these are your chickpeas, your kidney beans, your lentils. When we look at studies where people live well into longer, uh, well into older age, they include their legumes uh, at about three or four times per week. So think of the blue zones, think about a Mediterranean way of eating. The other 25%, you want to make sure it's your whole grain. So whether it's brown rice, wild rice, whole grain bread. Your drink of choice should be water over other drinks. Another way to gauge yourself and improve that diet quality is look at fruit. And your fruit should be at about three servings per day. And if you use a tennis ball as a serving size, that's a way to gauge yourself. So for example, grapes, people many times will ask me, well, how many grapes? Well, how many grapes fit into a tennis ball? And what's not missing here are some nuts. So again, if we go back to that global burden of disease and we're trying to improve our diet quality, we're looking at increasing our vegetables, we're increasing at, uh, looking at increasing our whole grains, we're looking at increasing fruit, increasing nuts and seeds. And if we wanted to even uh, look at Uh, uh, um, nuts and seeds, keep an eye on the amount of nuts and seeds, because a quarter cup of nuts and seeds, although a great addition to your diet, it is equivalent to about 170 calories. Another way to think about this is your breakfast. So again, you're trying to check, check off all those components in your diet, increase diet quality. Well, we know we want to lower our sodium. 
we want, well, at least not have it at 5,600 milligrams. We want to increase our fruit, we want to increase our vegetables, we want to increase whole grains, have more nuts and seeds. And the sixth one was incorporate more omega-3. So let's think of oatmeal for breakfast. So oatmeal is has no salt or sodium. It's a whole grain. You can add your fruit, so you check that off. Some people like the savory oatmeal for breakfast, so they can add their vegetables. You can have your nuts and seeds. And if you want to increase your omega-3s, you can use two, one to two tablespoons of ground flaxseed. And you've ticked off a lot of those components to increase diet quality. So I like to summarize this or end this off. The next slide, please, is a question I'd like you to think about is next time when you make a food choice, ask yourself with this food choice, am I feeding disease or fighting it? And so that's how I'd like to end it. So diet quality is really important. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Um, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask from our uh, viewers here. So there's a question, um, and I'll direct this to Dr. Ross. Has there been a study comparable to sodium for heart failure that looks at uh, a study less than 100, uh, 1,500 milligrams versus less than 200 milligrams of intake for hypertension? So I'm not familiar with any study in hypertension that's gotten all the way down to 1,500. Mm -hmm. uh, the DASH diet, which which Margaret uh, is 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 uh, can can certainly uh, expand on, is really the recommendation in the setting of hypertension, and it is probably the best studied. Um, mm -hmm. And there really is evidence, which is which is what the, the sodium trial was trying to do in heart failure was to to see if we could provide evidence, uh, you know, in a rigorous scientific way. Uh, for the question. And there is rigorous evidence for salt restriction in hypertension. Mm -hmm. There's still some debate. There really is still some debate out there, but we know that some people are more salt sensitive in hypertension than others. And so when we think about the non-drug treatment of hypertension, salt restriction, weight loss, exercise, alcohol minimization, and smoking cessation are five cardinal things that an individual can do, which might actually end up lowering the need for medications or the numbers of medications that a patient might require. So I, I'm, Margaret, I don't know if you want to throw yeah. in on the dash, but that really I will. is, yep. Yeah, and so I, to Dr. Ross's point, with the DASH diet, it stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, and really the focus there is improving diet quality, especially from fruits and vegetables. So again, we really want to think about what we should add to the diet, as opposed to always, what are we taking out? Because I think if we focus on what we should add, things that shouldn't be there will probably not be there. Okay, thank you. And the second question for Margaret is excess, excess of uh, sugar <laughs> worse than excess salt. Okay, so I don't, I don't know if it's worse, but what we do know as Canadians, we take in a huge amount of salt, a sugar rather. There is a link between excess sugar and heart disease. And so one way to, so a goal for us is for women uh, not to exceed 25 grams per day of sugars and then 35. And the way to think about that is each time you use a level teaspoon of sugar, whether it's white sugar, brown sugar, honey, for example, each teaspoon is equivalent to about four grams. So you can see how it can add up very quickly. Also some of our, one of a very popular foods such as yogurt, right? If you got plain yogurt versus fruit flavored yogurt, you can see the difference. There's a lot more added sugar to say a flavored yogurt. So try to keep your excess sugar down if you could. Another question to Dr. Ross. Do you expect the same results after uh, the studies you went through after a year or say two to five years? So that's a, that's a great question. Excellent. Uh, uh, John, that is a, you know, no surprise uh, from John. That is a, that's a really good question. And we will be continuing to follow people. They will no longer be required to stay on the restricted diet, but there is an extension uh, to the sodium trial. 
so a couple of other really important pieces about the sodium trial it was stopped a little early uh, before we hit the original uh, planned number of patients. And it was stopped a bit early for what's called futility, meaning that the independent committee of data scientists who reviewed all of the information that came from the study felt that there was no benefit in exposing additional patients to the study or to the question because it was unlikely to change the results or the answer that had been found. So that's maintaining that diet for one year and there will be the long-term follow-up. There will be a number of other studies that you know come off of this ma initial major trial uh, as I, I, met, I mentioned when I was speaking and I think some of them may help us because I think you know, I can look at the, the 67 people on this call and we look different. Um, so often, you know, and, and we can talk about this at another one of our sessions, I'm sure Anne would, would love to do it, but we often talk about how we reduce everything to, to one view, but we're all very different and we're all individuals and we do have different genetics and we do have different protein expression. Uh, and we do have different metabolisms. And so it may be that in some people, it is more important uh, to get lower in salt than in others. And th these are some of the things we can't say, you know, which is why, you know, in answering Jill's question around, you know, should I say does or, or I said may. And, you know, some of it is how we answer those questions depends on the, the rigor of the study, uh, how big the study was, uh, the type of way that we're evaluating the results at how long we study for and how well we can look to individual characteristics that might determine uh, the outcome. So that was a very long winded answer, sorry. Uh, but I think it speaks to the fact that stay tuned. I think when we do this webinar again in a year, uh, we're gonna have more information for you from some of the sub studies from, from the sodium trial. Okay, that's great. Um, we have more questions, but we'll answer them a little, little later on. Our next topic, and I would like to introduce nurse practitioner Stella Kuzusko, who will discuss participating in research, the Medley program, and the quality improvement project using Medley to help patients reach guideline-directed medical therapy safe, safety more effectively. Stella, oh, and also just like to add, we'll also hear from Patrick Searle, who will be speaking about his experience with Medley as a remote caregiver for his mom, Paula Henderson. Thank you. Stella? Hi, everybody. I'm uh, looking forward to sharing some information about Medley. Um, my main focus for the talk, for my talk this evening will be how Medley and the technology of Medley has helped develop projects and research to help our patients with the medical care for their, for their heart health. So what does Medley uh, look like? Medley looks like uh, it's an app on a phone. It encourages, um, patients to take control of their heart health by providing self-care guidance as well as access, provides access to a care team. It helps to monitor your health as well as receiving personalized um, care for your heart health. Um, it's been instrumental um, during the pandemic because we've been able to uh, put many of our heart failure patients on Medley um, following them remotely and minimizing their trips to the hospital. So this is what the Medley app looks like. There's a screen, this is a screenshot. So every morning patients will wake up um, and follow a, um, empty their bladder, check their weight, heart rate, blood pressure, answer a series of questions regarding their symptoms. And that's all, that all gets Push to their care team, including their cardiologist and a medley nurse coordinator at the other end. This is what we see at our end. So when we open up our screen, we will see every patient with their daily weights and parameters. And they are they come up as alerts. So a red alert would be a high priority alert and are dealt with before the other alerts. I guess this is me. That's me and my mom. <clears throat> uh, thanks so much for having me. My name is Patrick. And I'll just start by saying uh, the conversation about salt earlier 
has been at the dinner table for me and my mom for a number of years. So thank you so much, Margaret, because I think uh, lots of lots of uh, talking points to to really digest. Um, to use a, a food pun, uh, I want to participate tonight to speak a little bit about my experience as a remote caregiver to a patient, my mother, that's us at Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia in 2019, um, whose life has greatly improved because of her access to this platform medley, um, as well as the research and community at Ted Rogers and the entire team at Peter Monk and uh, the UHN. My mom's health journey with UHN uh, which is profiled actually in the upcoming Heart Hub website, uh, and for that I'm quite proud to see it, um, has spanned over a decade, but it's only been in the past year or so that she's been able to benefit from remote care options that meet her where she's at, uh, provide confidence of care, and provide me as a remote caregiver with the confidence that she is getting timely on-demand advice and guidance from her medical team in Toronto. Uh, as a remote caregiver, I believe really that Medley has altered her health trajectory for the better by adding another caregiver to my mother's circle of care. You see, I'm based in Toronto, which on a good day is only about two hours from London, Ontario, where my mom is based. But for her, the ability to get timely medical advice used to take way longer. Um, Whenever we had a question about a sudden change in heart failure symptoms, we were resigned to playing voicemail tag with a robotic answering service or emailing doctors directly, which was an exercise in Google searching doctor email addresses and praying we got the correct email and didn't spam someone in an entirely different department. This all changed when my mother was introduced to Medley in 2021 after her third open heart surgery in the fall of 2020. Medley changed the way my mother communicates with her healthcare team. It opened pathways of communication and transparency and information sharing. And for me as a caregiver, relief that we are supposed to be asking questions, raising concerns and seeking advice. Having another caregiver in the mix is a huge support to me, especially when I'm not with my mom on a daily basis. There are times I know she's spoken to her Medley team more than me in a day, and I'm okay with that. I credit Medley and the care of Dr. Adriana Luck, my mom's heart failure cardiologist, and Sarva Bat, her primary Medley clinical nurse coordinator, for stabilizing my mother's heart failure symptoms and providing her with that day-to-day -day support previously unavailable to her as a patient living outside of Toronto. And Dr. Ross, I trust with all your power that you will relay my appreciation to Dr. Luck and her team for being my mother's doctor and for supporting this important transformative program. I think my mother is stronger today than at any point in the past 10 years because of her access to Medley and the supervision of Dr. Luck and Sarva and the medical advancements at UHN. Specifically on research, I decided recently to participate in the Medley Caregiver related research because I believe that this program is transformative for both the patient who feels watched and seen, as well as for caregivers like myself, feeling that you have another set of hands at home helping to manage the symptoms. I'll close by saying I encourage all patients and caregivers to actually participate in Medley's caregiving research. Um, you feel at the end of it that you're helping to shape future updates to the program focused on increasing caregiver participation in digital care. As caregivers, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of life of those we care so deeply about. And this is a very easy way to participate. It was not time consuming, and I could tell that my lived experience as a caregiver was directly informing future changes. So with that, I want to say again, thank you to Anne and Augusta and the organizing team for inviting me here tonight to speak about that. Thank you to everyone who helps make Medley something that has changed my mother's life and my life for the better over the past few years. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. And we'll, uh, Stella will continue now to uh, discuss how Medley has helped us with doing research and quality improvement. Stella? That favorite expression, Stell, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> I was saying that that's really hard to follow. And, and Patrick, thank you for that feedback. That, that's mm -hmm. really important. And I, I work closely with Sarva and uh, I will pass on that, that message to him. 
So back to Medley and research. So how, how does it help Medley and research and how Medley helps is it detects trends and those trends and that patient feedback is what we feed back to our cardiology team to say, hey, we noticed this question is happening a lot or patients have this concern. And that's where research and um, um, projects are based from. It's really from the feedback of our, our patients. It identifies gaps and areas where we can improve care and optimize you know, uh, care in medication to improve heart care. Next slide. So uh, one of the projects that we um, were involved with, uh, with Dr. Um, Yaz Moyeti, Dr. Duaro Posada and Margaret and myself uh, was a quality improvement project. Um, in this project, we identified a percentage of our patients who were not able to tolerate full doses of one of their cardiac medications, specifically the MRA class. And examples are of those medications are spironolactone and diplerinone. And the intolerance was due uh, to the side effect of this medication, which was primarily a high potassium level. So our patients were not able to be on, on this medication or on the correct dose because potassium levels were too high and potassium is mainly found in the foods that we take in. So our quality improvement was try to try to take these patients and we wondered if by providing them um, Margaret's expertise in terms of diet management, whether that intervention would allow us to uh, put patients on this important medication for your heart and or maximize the doses of this medication. So the patient was seen by Margaret first and they underwent a very um, intense uh, diet teaching. And what the goal was try to try to identify foods that might be contributing to elevated potassium levels. And by reducing or eliminating these foods, uh, it would allow us to optimize their medications. They were also, patients were also used to uh, touch how to use uh, a food app. So that's two technologies now. We have Medley and then this food app that Margaret um, taught their, the patients how to use, which provided pictures of um, their food um, that they were eating. And then Margaret would review the pictures on the app and identify opportunities to tweak diet to try to help follow the low potassium diet. So. Where you think of technology, I think what comes to my mind is you think of technology as not being um, like patient-centered care, but it, it's quite the opposite where technology is actually providing really close patient-centered care. Uh, some people shy away from technology, just afraid of like having to deal with um, like the technology aspect of the care, but it really, for me, is the opposite. And we're, we're really providing um, patient-centered care. And this app, which I want Margaret to kind of show you because it, it was quite amazing how we can track foods and help people follow this low potassium diet. So I'm just gonna bring it over to Margaret and she's gonna show you the app and what it looks like. Yeah, so, um, so often when I, meet with someone, we ask for a diet history, but this is a really good way for people to just take photos of what they're eating. And so patients are loving the app. Uh, they don't have to write it down, you know, keep a food record for me or food diary. They take photos. They, some things do need some detail. So for example, if they had a cup of coffee and I noticed that they added something, well, was it cream? Was it uh, milk? Was it a plant-based milk? They'll add that type of detail. Uh, but generally speaking, these pictures will analyze the photos and generate a report for me. So I can look at macronutrients. So this is one example. So uh, if uh, of a, a close-up of what pa patients will take, but uh, they can add detail. So for example, another example where they, I would need some more detail is a pureed soup. I'm not quite sure what's in that pureed soup. So patients would list some of those details for me. But this is a great way to analyze their data. So the patient then gets a report uh, and it'll tell them where they're getting their potassium 
uh, distribute it throughout the day. And what I like best is this one here because it'll tell them, for example, these are the high potassium foods you're consuming. These are the low potassium foods. So, okay, I can have, uh, I'm on the right track here, but hey, wait a minute. You are having a low potassium foods, but your serving size is way too big. So because of your si serving size is larger, your, your potassium is going over 200 milligrams. So by definition, we use um, 200 milligrams as a definition for a low or a high potassium food. So it makes sense if your portion size is large, then your potassium is going to go up. So this is a great way to teach patients. They look at this and they can, uh, I can work with them and they too can do some self-learning as well. I just want to mention one more thing is that by having this, doing the project that we were able to, um, we were able to um, put most patients on their goal-directed mm -hmm. medical therapy just based on Margaret's teaching and uh, following the app. Yeah, and that's really important. One of the questions in the questionnaire box was around potassium. There is now a drug available uh, on the market to lower potassium. And so sometimes we could use a drug to lower potassium to allow us to increase the guideline directed medical therapy. But with Margaret, she's like better than a drug. Uh, <laughs> Uh, frankly, because Margaret was able to do as good a job as the drug, and you didn't have to pay for or take an additional medication. You just took Margaret in your pocket. That may have sounded strange, but you take <laughs> Mar Margaret with you in your pocket. You take photos of your food, and you can get your potassium down, and that allows us to increase your, your background medication, the medications that are associated with lowering the risk uh, of something bad happening. So uh, having Margaret in your pocket is a good deal. <laughs> okay, Margaret. <laughs> we'll figure that one out. <laughs> there for you. Uh, we do have one question, and it follows up with the potassium. Is that you can jump in? Uh, okay. How common is it for our heart patients to have to restrict potassium due to the vitamin K accumulation as a side effect of some of the heart uh, failure medications? A lot of healthy foods have a high K, like whole grains and nuts and so on. So how to balance that out? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what the exact number is. Dr. Ross, do you know what the exact number is for the percentage of patients? Yeah. So, uh, so how many patients have to restrict potassium? It's actually not uncommon for us to do low level, like the Heather Ross restriction, which is, you know, no bananas, no red licorice, uh, you know, the, the simple Heather Ross ones, uh, tomatoes, uh, you know, uh, easy things to have people cut down on. And then once that doesn't work, we, we I escalate to Margaret. Uh, that's my next step on potassium. And, and often Margaret will work on it. This is part of where this app has come in as a more systematic way to get potassium down. We have seen, because of the way the combination of medications has evolved to an increase in a drug called subcubitral valsartan or Entresto, which can raise potassium and increase use of a family of drugs known as mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or spironolactone or aplerinone, Inspra. And those drugs all can raise potassium. All of those drugs have been associated with improvements in symptoms and survival. So they're so important. So we are seeing more potassium issues than we did 10 years ago. And some of that is just an evolution. And there's some beta blockers that can affect potassium a little bit as well. So some of that is an evolution um, uh, in terms of the changes in drug therapy for heart failure. So we are seeing more than we used to. Uh, it's a smaller percentage that end up really uh, in, in, in a situation where we have to use this new drug uh, over and above the Margaret uh, in order to get the potassium down to adjust the medications. But it's enough that it matters to that individual patient if it's limiting their ability to go on a life-saving drug. So the question was, which app we're, that we're using? It's called uh, Rx Food. That was one question. I think there was another question too related to potassium. Santa? Okay. It's uh, due to the vitamin K, uh, heart failure patients are restricted potassium due to the vitamin K accumulation 
side effect of some of the heart failure meds and also because a lot of health uh, healthy foods have a high vitamin K. Uh, the, the, the potassium. Okay. Uh, yeah. So some of the healthy foods, so that's the importance of doing that diet history. So if I, you know, we do include some fruits, we do include vegetables, but it's the amounts and we can look at the um, amounts, for example. But, you know, for example, if I'm looking at a diet and a patient is really high in chocolate, well, chocolate is high potassium. So take out that chocolate, but maybe adding some of the whole grains could be part of that discussion. So we look at the overall diet and really see where the high culprits are for potassium, but also where are the unhealthy uh, sources of potassium, right? So maybe get, get minimize that chocolate, but maybe increase your whole grains. Okay. We're also, uh, and that'll be on the, uh, we're also learning like things traditionally thought to be high in potassium, like your beans and lentils. In fact, they, depending on how you're preparing them, they can be low potassium. So there's uh, some of those healthy foods can be in there. My, my favorite story is Margaret's uh, way of cooking potatoes to <laughs> eliminate potassium. This is, this is still, so Margaret, give an example based on the potato, because it's a really okay. good example. Okay. So, sure. All right. So there's some new, uh, some new evidence that um, were, uh, so tr in terms of how we protect, prepare potatoes. So traditionally, we would say a potato is high potassium. But what we know, uh, and so for, to put into perspective, potatoes about very close to 500 milligrams. So anything over 200 milligrams of potassium is considered high potassium. Okay. So if you take a potato, you peel it because you want to leach the, the potassium out. So you peel it, you cut it like a French style, a French fry style. Uh, so that made a difference on how you you cut your potato, you boil it actively for eight minutes, you have to drain the water. So you leak again, getting rid of all that potassium, fill it up with uh, fresh cold water, put it in the fridge uh, for 12 hours. And then again, uh, take out that water and the potassium in that potato goes from almost 500 milligrams to up close to 50 milligrams. So you can include your potatoes. So then you can air fry it or you can mash them, et cetera. And we're going to, we have a really nice diagram that we've added and we'll be adding one for legumes very shortly as well. Wow. Okay. That's something. Can you do that with a banana? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still stuck on the chocolate part, Margaret. So, well, we seem to be, we have run out of time, but we want to let everybody know, all the participants, that um, a lot of this information will be uh, included in part of our Health Hub website, um, where we go to learn, connect, and empower heart failure patients and their families. So you'll find a lot of this information there. You will find information, uh, latest updates of research and how to join a study and uh, Margaret already said she has her <laughs> recipe up there, Margaret, for mm -hmm. potatoes. So there we go. And it would answer much more questions. It's a great uh, website. I had the pleasure of working with it uh, on the committee with a lot of great uh, dedicated clinicians, heart failure patients and caregivers. So we're so happy. And there's the potassium, more questions on that. Uh, but I suggest and I for everybody just to go take a look at it. It's great. And we got a sneak peek just to kick off our heart health. Oh, sorry, heart failure awareness week. Um, so uh, we can go there. And then the next thing I think people don't know, we have a, a, a draw. So please, all the participants, we're having a draw for our sweatshirts, the, the Heart Hub sweatshirt. If everybody could see it. And we have ours on too. So, the presenters. Um, so put your name in the draw and there's the names of the winners already. So Yay. <laughs> so okay, and I guess just to close things, there's a, it looks so beautiful and it's so easy to follow the categories of information on right on top of the screen and the easy drop down menus. You'll see also this uh, webinar on uh, the YouTube channel on the website. So please go to it. It's, it's great and it's there for all, for all of us to share this information. Um, I guess in closing, 
I would like to thank Dr. Heather Ross, Margaret Brown, and Stella Kosisko for sharing the important life-saving information that you and your teams are performing on behalf of Parkville, your patients, and our families. Thank you to Patrick for sharing your story. I've had the pleasure of working with your lovely mother, Paula, on the website, a kind, generous, and courageous woman. We would also like to thank the audience for your participation in making this a truly learning experience. And thank you, Anne and Sam, for not only working in preparation for this webinar and Health Failure Awareness Week, but for all the work you do behind the scenes to make this possible. So thank you all. Have a great evening. Remember to check out the Heart, uh, the Heart Hub website. Happy Heart Failure Awareness Week, and have a good evening. <laughs>